coming. A lot of exciting changes going on over at Game Surplus. They got their new website coming in the next couple of weeks. And as far as things that are in stock, they got Tramways and Terraforming Mars both recently in stock. Ooh. Yeah, pretty excited about it. So definitely go check them out. Gamesurplus.com and tell them heavy cardboard when you do. Heavy Cardboard, episode 69, Nina and Pinta. Coming to you from Nina World, or Pinta World, or maybe Santa Maria World, or, you know, Denver, Colorado. Welcome to Heavy Cardboard, where we talk medium and heavy strategy board games, war games, 18xx, and other related topics in the board gaming hobby. We're your hosts. Hosts. I'm Edward. I'm Matt. And I'm Ash Jackson. So, we have Game of the Month this month. Is One of the games is Nina and Pinta. And it, so it kind of made sense since we all played the game together to go ahead and include Matt and Ash for the, for the review. Don't worry. Amanda will be back next week. There's... There's no ulterior stuff going on here. It just made sense to go ahead and bust out the review here since we're the ones playing it, right, fellas? Yeah, I think so. I feel like we've all been trapped in in a ship uh, crossing the Atlantic uh, for three weeks. And so finally we can come out, spring out and explore and tell everyone about what we saw. You make it sound so enticing and so exciting. You know, I didn't want to talk about the plague and the rats. Um, We had to eat our shoes. No, no, it was great. It was great. The hostile natives. So there's quite a bit of exciting news going on uh, here in heavy cardboard land. Well, first off, we announced that uh, we have our very first promo coming out for Lisboa. Thanks to Vital Lacerda, obviously the designer, friend of the show. Ian O'Toole, the artist, who, I mean, that's, that's kind of a winning group right there just in and of itself for your first promo. And also to Ego Griffin. It's going to be available at Origins and subsequent cons that we travel to this year, but we'll get all the details out to y'all in a little bit. I saw that tweet. Man, that card is gorgeous. It looks so good. The elephant and the and the diamond pattern on it. Oh man, I'm super super pretty stoked. I mean, I'll be honest. I mean, as y'all know, we're we're kind of fanboys of Ian O'Toole's artwork. We like. Vital's games, and so when when we, we were approached about this, I, the answer was uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, why not get you, get get a nice promo in Lisboa there? That is that is a great thing. Um, I know I want one. You're right. Yeah, I I want one or you know four hundred. So yeah, and even better, it looks like it belongs in the game. It really does. Ian did a really good job of fitting Davis into the theme, making it look yeah. like playing cards and stuff. So yeah, so that's the first. Gave him, the, gave him the royal treatment he deserves. <laughs> Absolutely. Today, actually, just a couple hours ago before we started recording, we got an email that was really unexpected. So Channel 2 News here in Denver has asked to come out to the house to interview Amanda and I for HeavyCon and the podcast, which no idea where that came from originally, and that was that blew me away. So next Wednesday... Uh, in fact, we'll be able to talk about it next episode. We're going to have the interview on TV. So pretty, pretty stoked about that. Congratulations, man. I mean, that's, that's amazing that y'all are getting that, that level of recognition, even just here at the local level. Yeah. With the new gate, with the new, uh, downstairs as the backdrop and, uh, maybe a couple of games out on the table to kind of showcase. That's going to be a very good thing for the hobby. So. I think so. I'm excited both for, obviously, Heavy Cardboard, me and Amanda, our game group, but also for the hobby and the heavier side of the hobby to boot. So, yeah, it's pretty much a win all the way around. We also have a surprise coming from Album VR, but we don't, we'll tease it at that and leave it at that. But super excited about what's coming down the pike there as well. We've also been doing a ton of playthroughs since the last episode. 1846. Kepler 3042, Great Western Trail, Age of Steam the Moon, speaking of Vita or speaking of Albin, 
the Great Zimbabwe. We did another one, which kind of smoothed out the play and the and the rules teach, and which. Up to date, that's now 21 live stream teaching and playing of games in the first month that the YouTube channel's been going. You know, that's decent output, right? Oh, wow. I I believe so. I wouldn't want to call it work, but uh, it's definitely fun, but it it, it is a bit draining at times to do that much streaming. I know, Edward, you got to be on all the time doing it. I know that uh, that definitely... uh, (laughs) It wears me out, dude. I ain't going to lie. There's definitely, especially this last weekend, we did one on Thursday, one on Friday, and then two or three on Saturday. And I, I, oh, no, we did two on Saturday and then 1846 on Sunday. And I was a zombie at work on Monday. But that's all right. I'm taking tomorrow off and I'm sleeping in. So, But just think of all the good that you've done now that these games have teaching and playthroughs. I mean, they're there forever. Yeah. You know, you've done it. It's done. It's there. And now a year from now, if somebody needs to learn, you know, uh, Great Kepler Western or Trail or, Mission, right, you yeah. forgot to mention too. Sorry. Um, you know, they're there. And oh, I, I don't get me wrong. I mean, I'm excited about it, genuinely, and I, I want to keep doing this, obviously. I'm just, I was just agreeing that, yeah. It, yeah. We all appreciate the sacrifice. <laughs> <laughs> Taking it for the old proverbial team there. Well, um, so what's going on in my life a little bit here is, uh, um, you know, working day to day, but my wife is writing a book, as uh, I think you've mentioned on the podcast before. Yep. Um, so she's she's heavy into that, and I'm, I'm being I'm supportive in, in that. Um but it's coming along really good. I've gotten to read a couple of snippets of it, and I'm, I'm which I'm really jealous because I haven't. Yeah, she's she's pretty close to the chest with it, I, I will say. But uh, she's um, she's getting her website up and running. She's starting to do some social media now. So um, hopefully soon um, we'll get something to publish. Which is pretty cool because she's been able to bounce stuff off of me as far as social media. And mm-hmm. she's like, "Wow, this is a lot of work." I was like, "Ain't it though?" <laughs> yeah, it's it's really interesting. You two being able to commiserate in that, um, just uh, trying. You know, trying to do something for yourself and get it off the ground. Um, totally. You're both, it's, uh, she's, she is in it. She's doing it full time. But, uh, I mean, you're doing your darndest to do it full time yourself. So Getting there. Um, that's, a, that's a good thing for you guys to share. So. Yeah, it's, it's cool to be able to have somebody else to be able to bounce that stuff off of, you know, whether it's having a bad day, whether it's, you know, stress about the show or in her case, you know, uh, critiquing or just... Not really writer's block or anything like that, but just the anxiety of acceptance, of putting your work out there. I mean, what you guys are doing right now, right? Putting that out there and having thousands of people, or hopefully it's the, she's the next J.K. Rowling and it's millions, millions. of people. Yeah. Uh, but having thousands of people out there to possibly critique your work. It's a little nerve, yep, she's, nerve-wracking. She's got a little note on her monitor that says, there's a critic for everything. Uh, <laughs> just, just, oh, just, oh boy, is that true. Yeah. But thankfully, uh, I'll be honest, our listeners are pretty amazing, as you guys know. Oh, um, yeah. I wouldn't be working so hard at this if I didn't love it. It wasn't fun and it wasn't rewarding. So, And I imagine it's going to be the same for Dana as well. Turns out building an empire is hard work. So I hear, right? <laughs> <laughs> This episode is brought to you by BoardGameTables.com. If you're in the market for a beautiful, hand-built, custom board game table that is sure to become the centerpiece of your game room, go check them out over at BoardGameTables.com and tell them Heavy Cardboard sent you. So since we have y'all on the show, I figure we'll talk a little bit as far as, you know, the front-end stuff that we always used to when we do our monthly briefings about acquired hunting been playing, anticipating, stuff like that. So as far as acquired, I'll start. There's only really been two things, one of which just came today, which is Steal This Game, which is from our buddy uh, Iraklis over at uh, at Luda Creations. Unfortunately, well, I guess fortunately I was there, but unfortunately that it happened to begin with, based on the, uh, the cash boxes getting stolen from a few oh, companies yeah, yeah. Uh, during, during Spiel last year. But A lot of good came out of that, and I'm excited to actually give this game a try. After that, also, I broke, finally broke down, and I said, you know what, I'm tired of of hemming and hawing and wondering whether or not I actually want to pick up this game, and I just bit the bullet and did, so I ordered a copy of The Lamps Are Going Out. Very excited about it. It's a World War I uh, card-driven game that I've heard that kind of like Triumph and Tragedy in that it could be ahistoric, 
possibly you could have the uh, the access. Uh, well, I guess that'd be the central powers trying to take over Moscow and stuff like that, which mm-hmm. obviously was nowhere near happening in actual World War One. But that said, I don't mind a little ahistoric for the simple fact that it gives the game a little bit of variety and and you it's not scripted like it's not going to go exactly how world war 1 went every single time exactly i mean you, that's the fun of those war games is exploring the possibilities of what if uh, the western front doesn't devolve into just siege warfare for the next 4 years right i don't want to play the simulation i want right. to play the game the what if game right. exactly yeah when i play those historical games what i'm really looking for is the feeling of the game the tension that that kind of stuff i want to feel like i'm there and Maybe if I was there, it would go better. That's the way I like to think of it. So maybe if I did something different, or maybe somebody else made a mistake that they didn't make in real life, it would have gone differently. And I like I like those what ifs. Sure, cool. So as far as acquired, anything from y'all? Um, my acquiring uh, partly is uh, is down, partly because of the time of year it is. You know, there's just not as many releases. But also for me personally, I'm going through a divorce, and so that's really put a damper on my acquisitions right now. As I could imagine. As it, as it can do. Yeah, as you do, you know. But that said, um, one of my Kickstarters arrived, TAC, a beautiful game, uh, and it is, and I can't wait to get it to the table. That's the all-wooden one, right? Exactly, right? that's the all-wooden one. Um, Wormwood was doing some of the fancier wooden pieces. Um, I didn't get any of those, but it still looks quite nice. And in fact, when you guys were last on the episode, uh, last on the show was the anticipation uh, show for what are you anticipating in 2017? And Tech was on your Tech list. Tech was on wasn't my it? list. You bet. I've played through the Learner game, and I'm very glad that I got it. Yeah. Uh, so that's uh, that's acquired or arrived, I should say. On my hunting list is one of my little story games that I'm interested in called Companions Tale. Uh, all the players are people who followed around some mythic hero around the land, and they're telling their version of the story. Oh, I knew them when they were just a young pup, and I taught them how to repost a sword. Or, oh, you know, I was a former lover, and I knew them in their worst of times. And it's just kind of a fun story game that explores things more obliquely than kind of head-on. I'll be honest, that's way out of my wheelhouse normally, but that sounds kind of... Kind of interesting. Lucky for you, it's on Kickstarter for just a couple more days. <laughs> Good sell, sir. Good sell. All right, me, my, uh, myself, um, I'm going to mention a game I also mentioned on the anticipation list, and that is Starving Artist. Uh, finally came in, and we've gotten a couple of plays of that in. And um, we've had a good time with it, I believe. It's it's a fun game. It's got a lot of great art. We haven't even seen all the art yet because it's just got a fat stack of art cards. And going through and trying to paint art before you starve to death is, is definitely a, a fun thing to do. I dig the theme. Like, literally, you're a starving artist. And if you don't sell paintings, go watch TV because you, you starved. Oh, and it's a gorgeous game, too. I mean, every card literally is a work of art. But the way they framed it, it's on a frame. The back of the card looks like the canvas. It's just gorgeous to see laid out on the table. I would agree with you mostly. Okay. Some of the artwork, especially like the modern art, I don't get it, man. I, it, there there were a couple of, of paintings that were in there that truly made me uncomfortable like sure. it, it, it made me agitated looking at it which i guess is the whole point art and there it, you go you want to feel something regardless of what it is you want to feel something when you look at art and i guess mission accomplished exactly uh, some of it was beautiful some of it was just god awful and some of it was <laughs> it looked like an elephant painted it well and you know if if a painting about the Spanish Civil War makes you uncomfortable, I think it's successful. And, yeah, that's starving artist. As far as anticipating or hunting, I don't know that I'm really hunting anything right now. With this being, what is it, March? You're looking at probably until June around Origins when games really start. Yeah. You know, that's yeah, kind of the release season. Uh, so there's nothing that I'm really hunting. Obviously, there's an, the anticipation geek list, and, and pretty much I'm... Everything I'm going to mention, I think, is on the geek list already. But nonetheless, something is going on with all these games. High Frontier, third edition. I did not back it on Kickstarter because I was really worried about them actually following through and it being worth a damn. However, 
a lot of folks have already gotten their copies and are just singing praises about how it looks and, and everything else. And I was like, okay, I'll pay the extra 20 bucks that I didn't have to, or that I didn't <laughs> save during the Kickstarter and went ahead and ordered that. So that's, okay. that's incoming. Other than that, it's pretty funny. I When I was making my list, I was like, wow, these are all Kickstarter games. But 18CZ just dropped on Kickstarter yesterday, mm-hmm. funded in under seven hours, which, dude, an 18XX game funded in under seven hours. Oh, yeah. And it's shipping from Europe, too. I mean, th- this thing has hurdles, and it funded in under 24 hours. Which is amazing. I'm really, really glad to see it. And... There are seven copies in route, or there will be seven copies coming to the Denver area. To the shock of no <laughs> one, considering we have, well, me, we have Paul Chad, and we have Tony. Well, there's truly, that's five copies. <laughs> Three people. I'll let you guys figure out where those might be Which going. Which is why I didn't feel the need to back it. Because um, <laughs> I knew there would be copies around. So I'm really excited to see uh, that go off really well, both... Lonnie's a really good guy, Lanny Orgler, the yep. designer, but also just for 18xx games in the 18xx community and the heavy game community in general. The fact that, you know, at the same time you have a game like Rising Sun that it last I saw was at $2.9 million, which, you know, it's got minis, it's got all this other stuff, it's got Eric Lang, it's got all this amazing stuff that people seem to really want, which, hey, play what you dig, right? But on the other side, you always got to worry about something so niche like an 18xx game. And to see it has over 200 people already backing it, I'm like, dude, that's that's a fantastic sign. That's so exciting. That I think that that's the, the indicator of the health of the niche, of our niches of the hobby, too. Totally agree. So the other two, also Kickstarters coming up. Hannibal, Rome vs. Carthage from oh, Phalanx Games. That's hitting Kickstarter. I want to say it was April 19th. The day might not be exact, but I know it's right around that time. I'm really looking forward to that. As well as the new edition of Brass. It's uh, Brass Lancashire. And super stoked to see what uh, what Roxley Games does with that. I will say this. Y'all seen that cover? That cover looks so looks sharp. Good. That I is, like that. That, that. That's like print quality. Like frame it. Put it, it, put it on your wall. Pretty. Oh, yeah. So, so yeah, as far as anticipating or, or, or whatever, I'd say those those three Kickstarters, really super stoked about that. And I'm super stoked for what you're going to get and bring into the house. Right? <laughs> get to play. Um, it, it's it one does, of the benefits of being here all yeah, the time. It, it does work out to your benefit, there's no doubt. Mm-hmm. Hannibal and Carthage was on my anticipation list, and I'm excited to see it too. I'm just not going to hold my breath. It's, it's taken long enough this far. I'll see it when I see it. Yeah, no doubt. And the fact that it has the long-awaited Hamilcar uh, expansion, or I don't know if you really want to call it an expansion, or almost like an add-on, or a even variant, its own maybe. its own game, maybe. Um, I'm not 100% sure what they're doing with it, but I know it's really hotly anticipated, and I'm looking forward to it. So what about looking forward to playing? I mean, we're all obviously a part of the game group here, so what what is it you guys are... Like Jones in to get to the table or looking forward to um, a game that uh, we've played a couple of times, um, but I'm looking to play some more. Some more Ave Roma. Um, it's a very interesting worker placement mechanic. It's got the nice round board. Um, we tend to we seem to prefer the the less the mute, more muted side as opposed to the more heavy artwork side. Yeah, just the, because it, of the it's busyness pretty. Of the board. It's pretty on the other side, yeah. but it's just functionally functionally not better me. on the other side. Yeah, yeah. yeah, totally. And I I love that whole. You know, I get an area's worth of workers back. I don't necessarily get my workers back. And we're going to review it on the show here coming up in the next month, six weeks, whatever. Uh, So I, I too, am looking forward to playing that. Have you played it yet, Ash? I haven't played it yet. And just hearing you describe it, that sounds like a neat twist on the worker placement game. Um, another one that I'm I'm kind of interested in playing some more of too that we've we've also played a little bit in the past was uh, is incorporated. Yeah, that came out of nowhere. Uh, it was on my anticipation list to look at when I went to Spiel, and I just never got around to it because Spiel's enormous. But I was able to touch base with the designer afterwards, and he sent us a copy, uh, kind enough to do so, and we played it, and it's almost. 
economic area control, I yeah, think. Yeah, it feels like an economic war game a bit, like the, a war of companies in a way, um, where you do like kind of mess with political powers, but only so you can get your goods into certain t- cities. Really. To be able to make money. And right. ultimately, yeah, you're pitting countries against one another and causing them to have conflict, but you don't really care about the actual companies at all. It's all about, like you said, getting those those industries going in that in those areas so that you can make money off of it. So it's right. profiteering from the conflict. Yeah, some of your companies are aligned with a certain faction, so you want to push that faction's agendas in certain other oh. other states to to be able to get in there and move your goods in and out. Um, whatever those goods happen to be, energy or or whatever, they're they're different colors really. In the yeah, day it's day, it's but. totally abstracted, but just the the concept of it though, mm-hmm. huh. it's really clever, and it, the production quality is pretty nice. Even though it's got this whole glossy thing that I hate when <laughs> when manufacturers, producers, uh, or publishers or designers, whoever's making the specific game, and we're going to talk about that more when we get to our feature review. Uh, just the glossy thing needs to go away because it makes it really hard to see. Uh, but anyway, outside of that... Um, That's only because you play board games in the light. I mean, Yeah, clearly, my bad. We, yeah, I sorry. We, we shouldn't have put so much light in the basement. Super well lit space. Right, my bad, <laughs> my bad. But no, uh, totally agree. Good call on Incorporated. Um, I know I'm excited to get to play more Age of Steam. It's one of the games of the month, um, and I've been had the chance to play a couple of maps and I need to sink my teeth into more. Is there any map in particular that you're you're looking forward to or is it more or less just I want to see what else is out there? I want to see what's in this vast world of Age of Steam maps. Okay. Uh, the the vast variety to me is so enticing. Cool. Good deal. I know we played the Pennsylvania 1830s uh, map um Late last week, uh, me and Ash did, and uh, had a lot of fun with that one. It's a very interesting map that's kind of... It, it only throws one one more kink in on the uh, Age of Steam. It throws one, one little wrinkle in there where you have coal to, to move across the map. And very good one. I like that one quite a bit. Yeah, 1830. I was like, oh, tra- uh, oh wait, no, it's Age of Steam, but it's yeah. coal. And, yeah. yeah. How'd you like it, Ash? Oh, I loved it. Uh, it was a surprisingly giving map, uh, considering the other maps I've played were the Netherlands XL at Heavycon last year, and then the Ireland map, which is a deliberately sparse map. So just to see that level of economic activity um, was interesting. Uh, I think I got around the income track four times by the end, by the wow. end scoring. All right. I'm looking forward to breaking out Soul Train. I'm hoping if player count works out right on Friday. If not, then we'll figure something else out and stream whichever we get to the table. I'm also interested in getting to play some of the older games that, you know, now that the buzz from Essen has died down, we've gotten through the novelty of those new games. I want to play some more Indonesia. Um, I'm really, really jonesing to play that. Um, It's a good thing we have about 16 copies in our group. I'm looking forward to it as well. I, I never get tired of pretty much any splatter game of the big five. So um, it's been a while since I've played Indonesia, I, and I think it'd be awesome to live stream that puppy. As far as, for me, looking forward to playing, I'm noticing it's it's heavy on war games. I know, shocker, I know. But Fields of Despair, Lamps are going out. I mean, we did just pick this up. As well as, you know, one that desperately needs to hit the table, Hands in the Sea. Some people could argue whether or not it's a war game. It's a conflict simulation. I was listening to Wild Weasel, uh, in fact, yesterday, and he had Harold Buchanan, designer of Liberty or Death, on. And they were talking about how the semantics of, is it a war game? Is it not a war game? Who gives a shit? Yeah. It's a conflict simulation. Okay. That's really all that matters. And I was like, yeah, I like that. So I think that's the direction I'm going to go as far as calling it. The other one that uh, I'm super excited to get to the table more is the 2016 publication of the 2010 version of Venus. <laughs> In other words, the nice version of the old Venus. Yep. I, I really want to get that to the table. I want to live stream that and teach that to folks. I think that would be uh, be something cool to do. Plus, I just want to play it. Yeah, yeah. I need to get that one on the list too. So as far as had been playing, what y'all got? Um, let's see, we've been, a lot of Nina and Pinta, of Obviously, course. Obviously, sure. 
Um, it, basically, we can just kind of go back through the live streams. That's pretty much what we've been <laughs> what we've been doing. Um, in 1846, Kepler 3042, Great Western Trail, Age of Steam, Great Zimbabwe, Star of an Artist. Yeah, I missed out on a lot of games last weekend doing to be on call at work, but uh, I, I got to relive them this week while at work <laughs> by watching them again. So Almost as good, I'm almost, guessing. Almost as good, not quite, but almost. As for me, I've been playing a ton of PAX Renaissance. And even a solo game the other night, just to make sure that I had the rules under my belt in case I needed to teach it to anyone. Huh. Um, Yet another game that would be good to stream. How about that? As y'all know, as anyone who's been watching the streams knows, I've also been playing Age of Steam and Maria. Um, I also got a game in another game in of Scythe, which is I'm still trying to figure it out. Um, not not the game itself, but kind of my my opinion on it. And then little stuff, uh, Eight Minute Empire. Um, some uh, I got to play a little game called Captain Sonar, which was a fun little fun little game. And then uh, with my son, who's three, uh, we've been playing the game I bought him called Go Away Monster, and it is so much fun. You reach into a bag. There's a little cardboard chit in there, and you have to feel around. Is it a painting? Is it a lamp? Or is it a monster? And then you throw the monster in the box lid and say, "Go away, monster!" And my son, he's a pretty good shot. He may play basketball. <laughs> or he may play board games. Or both. Or both. Why, why can't it be both? So on top of that, normally we don't ever talk about things that aren't board games in this section. But seeing as it's the first video game that I've bought now since Skyrim, the original Skyrim came out. So outside that's, of... That's a few years now. Yeah. So outside of, you know, Steam, the Steam sales, which, I mean, everybody... Blows money on that, right? Yeah. Uh, so picked up Horizon Zero Dawn, and it's entirely your fault, Matt. <laughs> I know. I I rented it while you guys were in Portland, and I sat. That's pretty much what I did while y'all were in Portland. I was like, yeah, there's no there's no board gaming this week, and I'm gonna sit down and play this. I sat down and played it. Woke up 20 hours later, it looked like, and then the weekend was over. And I'm like, but I had a good time <laughs> killing killing robot animals for about 20 hours. And then um, I forgot to take it back on Monday morning, and because our oh, flight gosh. and because our flight got in late, so late it got we didn't get home till uh, basically two thirty in the morning. I was like, "Yeah, we're not going to work on Monday," so we laid low, and I went down to the basement, and I was like, "Ah, oh, ah, oh, what's this? <laughs> Look what we have here!" And I was like, "Cause when it had all this buzz around it when it, before it came out and everything," and I was like. The idea of robots and, and killing these animal-type robots, I was like, eh, it just didn't grab me. Didn't interest me. The open world, you know, Skyrim, Fallout, that type stuff, that totally did. That is so my wheelhouse when it comes to video games. But I was like, eh, I just don't know about this whole robot thing. Yep, oops, nope. <laughs> Bought it next day. Yep, it, it has that way of uh, catching you off guard a little bit by just sucking you into the world. The story's fantastic. The visuals are amazing. Dude, the um, visuals are crazy. And you neither of us realized that, you know, it's local here. It's set here in right. Colorado. So, yeah, there were a couple of places where you just get to, and I, I had no idea. I walk over a ridge, and I go, oh, my. Uh, I, that's Red Rocks. Uh, I've, <laughs> I've, I've, I know where this is. I drive by it almost every day. Um, on the way to work, so... So now I have to ask, since you're tromping around far future Colorado, uh, killing mechanical woolly mammoths, have you found your house yet? No, I I, ha I don't have my bearings yet uh, of where okay. I am. Matt is for much further along in the game than I am. Uh, but it's... The story is shockingly compelling. I'm actually mm. really... I was I I was really pissed off at one point uh, towards I guess it's the end of or the end of the prologue which I think I spent like almost twenty hours just in the first little starter area because I'm the type of guy that's like ooh shiny you know <laughs> nope stay on target whereas in board games stay on target stay yeah. no dude I'm like oh yeah I'm in the middle of this what oh what's what what's that what's that over that ridge yeah, what what is that and dude I. This is where my childhood of moving around from place to place to place, mm -hmm. the, this whole wanderlust thing that I have, it's always the what's around the next corner. Yep. So don't get me wrong. I love Civ, right? Sure. The, the new one came out. I avoided it because of that whole one more turn thing. Yep. Whereas in this, it's, oh, I want to see what's over that hill. Or wait, I hear water. 
Is that a waterfall? Let me go check that out. And it's just, it's, it's, yeah, I absolutely love this. And the fact that you can tame these robots and ride them, that's pretty cool. It sounds like it's a good thing that I don't own a PS4. Yeah, it's just it's been a good it's been a good little break from all the board games every once in a while. Just a good little kind of downtime just to go exploring and um, craft some crazy arrows and shoot things and trap them and tame them and and uh, just make your way through that game. And yeah, and the fact that it's a hunt you're essentially a hunter or like a, a ranger type. Uh, you can do hand-to-hand combat, stuff like that, but I try to focus death from afar, which I've always been drawn to in all these video games, whether it's, you know, a sniper in Fallout or, a, you know, that, that whole using a, a stealthy bow in stuff like Skyrim. I've always been attracted to that, and yeah, plus, I gotta say, having a 75-inch TV in the basement and having this on there as pretty as it is, and it has HDR, oh my... It looks so pretty, so pretty. But yeah, definitely a lot of fun, and it's it's a nice diversion, like you said. To, you know what? We're done streaming, or, or or that one day, you know, we we take the occasional day off from anything show related. Cool. I'm gonna take an hour and a half and go down there. And wait, what do you mean it's been an hour and a half already? <laughs> really, really, really enjoying that game. Quantum physics in a board game, not something you expect to hear on a regular basis or like, you know, ever, unless Phil Eklund's name is probably on it, right? But here we are, Nina and Pinta, fairly new game from Ragnar Brothers, published in 2016, designed by the Ragnar Brothers, Steve and Phil Kendall and Gary Dickin. The artwork is by Marco Primo. It plays... Two to four players, and it says 45 to 120 minutes. As far as availability and cost, shocker, it's actually available right now at Game Surplus for 40 bucks. So scalability. I feel like this one's a bit of an odd duck in that it says two to four players, so it seems like it should be two to four players. However, It has one setup for a two-player game and then the same setup for three and four-player game. And it's really wide open at three-player and a much more interesting game at four-player. What what have you guys, what are your thoughts? Definitely agree with that. Um, The three-player game that we played the first time was definitely eh, a lot less interesting. A lot less, not as tight, not as, everything felt a little more open, but then we got into the four-player game, things really tightened up a bit, and it felt like there was a lot more tension. And a lot more interaction as well. I think so, too. Uh, The way that the map interacts with your pieces um, clearly is meant to be tight at two and at four. And our three-player game was fairly loose, and like you said, there wasn't as much interaction as I was hoping for, and then the four-player game came and gave it to me. And I feel like really it plays at two and four. Totally agree with that. So why don't we give folks some context? In Nina and Pinta, each player is a European power in the age of colonization, on the cusp of exploring the new world. But there's a wrinkle in space and time. Because there's not just one new world, there's three. Uh That's three Caribbeans, three Patagonias, three Rocky Mountains. Woohoo! You will send your three ships to each of these new worlds to explore and settle, and then harvest or pillage the riches you find there. All to bring gold back, all so you can do it again. But what will you find in these new worlds? Tell us. Fertile land, gold in the mountains, or a barren desert? There's only one way to find out. So, in Nina and Pinta, uh, each, each player is one of the traditional kind of European colonizing powers, England, France, Portugal, Spain, and over the course of six eras, you'll... Load your boats with captains and settlers. Set them adrift on their way to one of three new worlds, Nina World, Pinta World, Santa Maria World, uh, to explore it, hope it has good stuff, uh, so you can bring gold back and, like I said, do it again. So let's go ahead and break down, as far as complexity, for rules overhead and such. Yeah, what you got? For me, the rules... Once I have them, the rules don't seem that complex. It's the learning of the rules and the great number of conditional um, effects or uh, temporary status that's 
that exist within the game that's hard to keep track of, that's hard to learn, that made the learning more... Mm, Non-intuitive, yeah. I think, is a good way to put it. At least it was for me. For me, too. And I'm trying to keep an open mind that it's a different kind of game. It's a quantum game. Um, but for me, learning it was more difficult than it seemed like it should have been, given the rules and what I know about the rules now. It seems like yeah, there were a lot of except if um, things going on here. It's like, you can do this, except if there's a captain yeah. there. Except if you don't have three guys in the exact right way or except if there's not the right builder builder um grow token out there um so there's there's a lot of status changes yes i agree that you have to keep track of and when you're trying to learn it from the rules that that's definitely difficult yeah it it just fiddly rules i think is a good way or is how i think of it that it's just it's it just some of the rules felt like they they negatively impacted my ability to learn the game and it just I felt like it was a big fight through the rules to get to where the rules got out of the way yeah yeah now it's funny that you say uh, those except if rules uh, because those are the rules I actually like I like those parts of the of the game the rules about building towns um, which we can go into more detail later um, but those are th those except if parts are the parts I like now that I actually have them shoved into my head. Exactly. I wasn't saying that much as a downside, just as much as it is, it's it's difficult when you're trying to learn from the rules that it makes that a little more difficult. Yep. So as far as planning, you know, how, how much thinking ahead you, you feel you have to do in this game, do you think it's getting its weight from that? Oh my, yes. All of the game is in planning things out two, three, four eras ahead to make sure that you're properly positioned so that you can build that town, so that you can harvest that gold, so you can connect back to your existing supply train and get the full benefit of your three last turns of effort. How many times did early on be like, yep, screwed that up, wasn't thinking at all on what I was supposed to be doing here? Not even early on. I did that in the third game. <laughs> I was, you know, sh ooh, shiny, losing track of what I was supposed to be doing, not staying on target, and paying the penalty as a result. And then the very next term, one of those statuses we just talked about changes, and then your plan no longer works, and now you must go to plan B, and or it's time to pivot. C, or however that many letters you have to go to before you get to a good plan. Yeah, you were, you were at one point, you were later in turn order, and you were like, yeah, that went plan A and B. <laughs> Give me a minute. Yeah. There is some, some randomness in this game, specifically the exploring of the lands and a variable setup, but that's all hidden to the players until they've all explored it. There's the order of the build and grow tokens. What world are you going to be allowed to build towns in? What world are you going to be allowed to build cities in? And what worlds are going to have a plus one on the population for those grow tokens? Not to mention which benefits are available each round. The nice thing, though, is the order of the build grow tokens. You don't know the order, but those are flipped over at the beginning of the round, as are the benefits that you're going to be able to get, whether it's endgame scoring benefits or rule breakers that you're going to be able to use throughout the, the game. All that's available at the beginning of each round. So at least there's that, but there's still those gotcha moments maybe as far as exploring the land but thematically it kind of fits right i think so um and for me this is luck that all the players are dealing with at the same time it's not you got a crummy dice roll it's oh we all got uh you know a grow token in a world that nobody cared about and now you know it's all time for us to pivot and change our strategy you know you explore caribbean and you get barren land that happens sometimes but there's the silver lining of a civilization to pillage. Mind you, it ties up your captain until the end of next round, which is brutal and painful, but you got a nice chunk of change out of it. Um, I feel like the, the luck and the randomness is fitting an exploration themed game. And to me, it is luck you can plan around, react to and mitigate. And everyone's planning and playing around the same set of luck factors. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. Um, it's it's a lot of fun to sail off to a new land and not knowing exactly what you're going to find when you get there. Um, sometimes there's a civilization you must get out of the way first before you can do anything. Sometimes there's an ice desert. Um, <laughs> it, as, as happens, right? <laughs> right. Um, 
it's also very interesting the way it, it kind of um, each of the worlds kind of plays off each other a little bit when you go to do other things. They can affect each other um, in a quantum like way. Yep. Mm. And I, I, I agree that it fits the theme and I like the exploration. And I think you put it real well, Ash, as far as it's maybe not mitigatable, but you at least know it in advance to be able to work around it yeah. and yeah, who works or who works around it the best benefits the best and that's kind of kind of how it should be right i think so now the game length it says it plays in 45 minutes to 2 hours uh do you feel like it contributes to the weight of the game do you feel like it it, it, it did it overstay did it not feel like enough what do y'all think i think the timing is tuned just right uh, you go through the arc of the game, you're, you know, scrabbling for money in the beginning, you get an engine going by the middle, and just when it would have otherwise, uh, you know, just when it's time to end, it ends. It's, it's era six, it's time to buy up your victory point pieces, and the game's over and you're counting score. I, yes, I agree. Um, it doesn't seem like... Um I'm really going, oh, I wish I had one more turn. It's like, no, I've had just the right amount of turns. I just didn't do something quite right if I'm not where I want to be. I will say there was one point in one of the games to where I was like, we really have three more rounds. And then I was like, oh, I still want to be able to do this, this, and this. And I'm like, yeah, okay. Yeah. No, that seems right. So I don't think it contributes to the weight in any way, but I do feel like it's it's game appropriate. Yeah, I wasn't watching the clock while we were playing. No, or nor like, was I. Or, or like, oh, when is this going to end? So there wasn't any of that, which is always a good sign, right? Agreed. As far as getting it, so I'll take this one first. So for me, um, that first game was was hard learning uh, as a learning game. A lot of times, you know, a learning game, okay, you don't put a lot of stock into it, and that's fine. I really felt like I was fighting it the entire game, even though there wasn't anything. There wasn't a big twist on the scoring. There wasn't, even though it, it's the the flavor du jour as far as it's a score pad, so nobody has a score track, and and you never know exactly where things are going to play out. You have a ballpark idea, but that said, even though there isn't any real gotcha moments or anything like that, it took the entire first game for me to really feel like, well, until the second game to really feel like, hey, I. I get it. Okay, now the rules are getting out of the way. Now finally, I can play the game like like I should, like I you know focused on the game. It actually took me probably even into the uh, almost the third game to really kind of get the flow of the game. Um, how uh, which ship needs to go out when, and how many dudes to put on it to make sure I get to where I need to go, and then also looking at the map to see. Um, you know, where other people may or may not go to kind of game that a little bit. So I'd say almost probably into my second game before we got it. Because, to be honest, the first game at three players and the second game at four players were vastly different. That's a fair point, actually. Really good point. As for me, um, I'm going to kind of split split the answer into two parts. By halfway through our first game, I understood what I should have been doing the whole time and what I needed to do to try to make up for it by the end of the game. Um, that said, even in our third game, I was still looking at the map and thinking I could do a thing when, uh, mm, there's no do build, it. there's right. no build token. Those status markers, those, the changing game state, um, I wasn't quite keeping track of all the little bits of the rules, um, to kind of make sure that I was doing what I could actually do within the game. So you were planning for things that you weren't actually able to do because you forgot this little rule right. or this little marker or whatever, which would have would have otherwise been an illegal move. My captain is in Nina World. I can't send another captain to Nina World. So ultimately, where would you say this game falls weight-wise, be hmm. it across all those things? That's tough. I think for me, it's medium heavy. Um, it's more than other medium games I'm thinking of, but it's not kind of the true the true heavyweight. Yeah, I put it medium heavy as well, just because of all the, the changing game states you've got to keep track of. There's a lot of mental accounting here, not as not, not to mention playing everybody else's game to try to figure out where to go. So yeah, definitely medium heavy for me as well. I would agree as far as the weight, 
but I would add in, and some people don't like the fact that uh, we take uh, rules complexity into the fa- into account when it comes to how we judge weight. But I feel like it definitely comes into play here that the rules kind of fight you a little bit because yeah. of that thing that you just brought up, Ash. Like, I got all this, all this, oh, wait, I didn't see that this marker is or isn't here. So, therefore, all this screwed up my plan because I forgot that. And that makes it really tricky and less than intuitive, I feel like. And so that's part of what I think contributes to making it medium heavy as well. Yeah. So let's talk about the cardboard. Starting with the components. I'll, Oof. I'll yeah. say it. <laughs> yeah, you go ahead. The board is bad. Um, I don't like the fact that it, it it's bowing, it's, it's warping. Neither here nor there. We can We can deal with that, right? But it's got that glossy finish on it that makes it really hard to see. And it's, we'll talk about the art, the artwork on it here in a little bit. But as far as just, it impedes play. Just yeah. the fact that that glossy covering on the, a uh, finish on the board just, it drives me nuts. Well, and the board's, I think, curled, I mean, five millimeters. Like, it's not a small amount. It is, uh, it is a substantial amount for what should be a flat piece of, cardboard yeah. it's thinner than your typical yeah. cardboard or you know thick uh mounted board is I'm, is is what we're used to and it just it, it seems the component quality is below the level that you would come to expect i think from a a a reasonably sized publisher yeah yeah even when we're, we're stacking things on top of them and things don't line up at all because one's on one side of the board and one's on the other it's like is there more or less in that stack <laughs> no, it's, it's the tell. same yeah it's the same we got to count them because you can't see there's the wooden meeples which i appreciate the wooden meeples however the fact that the captains wear pants uh <laughs> they look like meeples whereas the 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 settlers are a little bit smaller and they kind of were wearing like almost kilts like or yeah, it's a it's the difference of a meeple with legs versus a, le- a meeple that's just a vertical piece of wood or shaped like a person. And it was a little hard to tell them apart at times, or at least it was for me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's where we really came up with the whole captains wear pants thing. We we, we kept saying, "Yep, captains wear pants." Remember that? <laughs> that he's out there. Um, I think uh, we got to laying them down. Um, we did it for the live stream, but I think it actually, it actually helped. helped. It yeah. helped a lot um, it, within differentiating the two. Yes. Um, another thing with the components is I think due to some of those rule complexities and all the state changes in the game, there are some of them that are just really hard to see. They just don't stand out very well. Um, and I think that really hinders the game. Well, it kind of rolls into the artwork and the graphic design here as far as it's it's busy. The board is busier than I would want it to be because of exactly that. I want these things to be clearly labeled and I want to be able to see them at a glance. Oh, wait, I forgot. It doesn't have that build token and it's re- it blends in, right? Oh, yeah. Or or where are the state of war markers? Where can I actually go and attack? Nope, there's not one because it's on this globe looking area, which I understand why they marked it the way it did. It just, it's, it's, it's form over function when it needs to be function over form. For me, uh, I was always looking at the board and not reading uh, at first even which world was which. Pinta world versus Santa Maria world. And later, which world has a grow token on it? Is it a blue circle or is it a blue token on top of a blue circle? Um, Keeping track of those build tokens. And then even when you're uh, advancing from round to round, how many state of war markers go out? It's this glossy waving war pennant, which and looks like two or three flat. Nope, it's just one. It's one. It's one. Um, for me, the artwork and the graphic design, combined with the production of the glossy uh, finish on the cardboard, hinder is the wrong word. It's not a hindrance, but to me, it is an encumbrance to playing the game. It weighs you down. It drags you. It makes you. You have to pull it along behind you to get to play what I think is a pretty interesting mechanically uh, sound game. I got nothing else to add to that. I think you nailed it. Moving on to the rule book. Not great, I think is a good way to put it. It it lacks examples, and there are still some holes in which we had to make inferences. Like, for instance, in the rule book, that, or in the in the game, you're going to come across different tokens for, for benefits. And there's a increased corn that goes into the planes. Place on any planes land. 
Well, there is a land out there that's called uh, multi... Uh, it's mixed. It's comprised of all three of the other land types. Mountains, forests, plains. So can I put that in a mixed terrain because it has plains in it? Or must it go in only a plains? I don't know. And then the biggest issue that we had with this was understanding the the qualifications to be able to build a town or a city. So ordinarily, when you're building a town, you must have a set of three lands, either of these two types. You need three of a kind, and Me that means a Caribbean and Pinta world, a Caribbean and Santa Maria world, and a Caribbean and Nina world. So there's your three of a kind, and that would be to build a town in the Caribbean in one of those three. Oh, by the way, that has the build token out. Or in a single world, that you have connected with all of your pieces, your settlement pieces, three different types of terrain. Which begs the question, mixed terrain, is that all three? Or, so if I had three different mixed terrains, is that, is that three, three different, different lands? I don't know. We ultimately S said no. We said mixed terrain is its own animal. It is not mountains, it is not plains, it is not forests. <sighs> Yeah, it was definitely a confusing point there. Is the which which one is it? We we ultimately said no. It still could have been yes, maybe, but we ultimately had to rely on the way the rule book is laid out. In that the land types, there's a box for each land type, and so mixed said, is in a different box. Exactly, and so that's what we went with. And then there's the whole captains and transporting, <laughs> and what captains can and can't do. Which again, it's it's just not written real well and super clear and a little bit for me at least you know once we got the rules okay fine we you know i wasn't reading the book but we had to struggle through it and okay now we understand it it was a struggle to remember it too you know captains wear pants they don't carry gold and they don't work captains direct they don't work and one more thing it's it's poor word choice i believe in the rules is the difference between the word settlement and settlers because yeah. they are two different things in this game. Like, you change one to colonists, and you don't have a problem. Totally agree with that. And this is, I mean, this is a trend. The, for a handful of episodes now, going back a couple of months, I've been harping on publishers that I don't care how good you think the rule book is. You have been building this game, designing this game, likely for years. You're immune to anything worded wrong in your rule book. Your job as a, as a publisher, designer, developer, hand it to somebody, blind, blind teaching. Give them the game and say, here, go learn the rule book or go, go learn the game. If you can't, where are the issues? Point them out to me. I don't care what the designer or whoever wrote the rule book thinks. If people have a tr have trouble playing or learning your game from the rule book, there's a problem. And the fact that we have to make inferences and guesstimations and I thinks, that's an issue. Especially for a game like this where, to me, half the point of the game is this intricacy of the rules and this lining up of the game states where things have to be just so. You need the rule book to be just so, too. We've now played the game a handful of times together over, you know, two of the play counts. What did you enjoy about the game? Uh, for me, firstly, I love colonization-themed games. I played colonization a ton when I was a kid. Um, I love the, you know, the exploration of the new world. Um, I love those themes and, you know, the, the offshoots of Pillaging the native civilizations and confronting that whole part of the, the reality. Warmonger. Oh, no. Um, and then, so I, I'm predisposed to like this game. I like the theme. I also like the uniqueness of the theme, the quantum worlds, the three parallel new worlds into which you're sending ships. The, you know, to me, that's a fun kind of postmodern twist on, okay, here's a standard board game trope, explore the new world, haha, -ha, there's three of them at the same time. To me, that's cool. Um, I also like the kaleidoscoping uh, game state where it's constantly changing 
How so? When you say constantly changing, you're saying by the players affecting the the game, or are you saying the game affecting the game? Uh, Partly the game affecting the game. What terrains come out, you know? Pinta World in one game was a barren wasteland. You couldn't get anything going there. There was no grow token. There was no build token. Half the lands were barren. And on the other side of the world... Ice deserts. Ice desert. The blue ice deserts. And on the other side was... An explosion teeming with gold and cities and towns. And that was just how the cards and how the lands came out. And it played completely different between the last two plays that we had of this. Oh, yeah. Even though it was four player, because of the way the different lands came out. And the and, tokens. And, and the way the actual land tokens or the land uh, tiles and the tokens themselves. The two games played completely differently from one another. One of the things I really enjoy about this game, too, is just um, trying to figure out what the other players are going to do based on the map state and the current state of the game. Um, A lot of the land areas have a certain amount of people that can be there, so you can look real easy at that land. Oh, there's already two people there. I sail somebody there. If I don't have a captain, I'm not fighting anybody. If it's not in a state of war then one of my guys is going to die. Maybe we don't go there this turn. Maybe we try to go someplace else. But on that flip side, if you're later in turn order, maybe somebody will change that game state. And so you're betting, you know what? I think somebody's going to go do X, Y, or Z. So maybe I can load up that one extra settler onto my ship and take that chance because you all do it, or we all do it simultaneously behind the player screens to where... How many am I going to send to what world and... To which land. Right. Not only your true point. And what order in which am I going to sail my three ships? Mm -hmm. And the fact that they have to be sent with the most settlers and captains, most dudes on a ship first, uh, makes for a really interesting twist on, I can put three guys on this ship. However, if I do, that means I have to sail it first. Whereas if I only put two, then I have an option to send it later in the turn order, which may end up benefiting me more later on. And the other kicker to that is all the people that you put on these ships, you got to pay for. Yep. And money is also how you're going to later on be turning your, you're going to be buying these tokens from the game for points at the end. So... It's points. How many do I put out there? Do I load up my ships? Especially if you're England and you've got all those, you can put four people on a ship. Do I load up all my ships or do I save some money back and try to get some of those tokens later on? Now, that's interesting to me to hear you describe, um, oh, I'll, I want to put three on this ship, but I'll take one off. So it goes in the order I need it to. I did the opposite. If I wanted to dictate my ter- my ship order, I loaded guys on. I pile them up and I would pay to be able to choose which ship goes first. And to me, that's interesting. I think the score pad see, shows the folly in my strategy, but it's interesting to me that there's that problem and there's multiple ways around it. And the fact that you have to decide before those screens are lifted, because everybody reveals simultaneously, it's just, it's there's a bit of meta as well as your ability to read the game state. And your opponents. Totally. And then you reveal the the and then you pull back the player screens and say, "Oh no, now I'm not going to get what I wanted." Yep. Or, you know, wait, poker face. <laughs> I think in our three playthroughs that we've seen the full spectrum that the game has to offer as far as the economy of the game. We saw a very giving, very lush economy in our last game. I mean, we ran the game out of coins, actually. Yeah, we broke the bank. Uh, Not that that's a mechanic in the game, but we built all the cities, we ran out of money, we had to go borrow money from someone else. And we were able to figure out it was going to be that way early on in the game, and so almost nobody was investing in military because military is based off of points of cities that are not built. And we all saw, wow, there's going to be so much money in this game that we know all seven cities are going to get built. Military's not going to be worth crap, and nobody outside of Matt, who took a few, outside of that, nobody bothered investing. So I found that really interesting. We responded accordingly. The game said... Here's how it's going to be. And we got to act. And uh, in our second game, we saw the exact opposite. We saw a very sparse, um, hard scrabble, austere game where 
I think there were four of the seven cities unbuilt by the end. Um, and to me, it's I like that there's that wide of a spectrum uh, in the game state. And like you said, we had the chance to respond to it from, you know, within the thir- first third of the game. And you saw how differently uh I was betting on the come in the second game as far as I was loading up on military because I saw that there wasn't going to be a lot of money. And I was thinking, you know, I think these are going to be worth a lot of points at the end. But I like that I couldn't come into the game with a preconceived notion of what kind of plan I was going to have. I had to... uh, Form it on the fly based on what we found in the in the new world, which kind of thematic for an exploration game, kind of a three X kind of game. Yeah, I think so. And for me, I like also that uh, from the first couple of eras, you know, you start exploring, and the end game picture slowly begins to crystallize. It slowly comes into focus that arts will be worth a lot, or like Edward said, military. And the way that you go about pursuing those slowly coalescing endgame goals, to me, um, it was a lot of fun. was a lot of the fun for me in this game. Right, and a couple of those endgame bonuses kind of counterbalance each other. Like you said, the military comes out. Um, it'll be strong if there aren't as many cities built. The other ones will be stronger if there are more cities built. And um, kind of judging that, if you go high in military, maybe you just kind of stop people from building cities instead of um, building them yourself um, just to get the more points there. Go and attack and kill their colony or their settlers so that they don't have people there to be able to build cities. And all of a sudden, if, oh, they were in all three Amazonias, well, sorry, now you're not. And now you can't build that city anymore. Um, I liken it to trying to climb a mountain while the mountain is moving underneath you, uh, keeping track of those changing game states. The player induced one is, ones as well lends a lot of kind of crunchiness to the game. So on the flip side, things we're not super keen with. So here I'll go point counterpoint to you, Ash, where you were like, you thought the quantum theme was was fantastic. I like the idea of it. I just don't know how much it really comes through in the game. I feel like, sure, you're calling it that, but just because this world is the same as this world is the same, it doesn't make it feel like a quantum game. Sure. Does that make sense? Like, it, Oh, that it, makes it, perfect it, sense. It just didn't feel like anything. It These are these three different lands. It could have been... You know, it could Nebraska, have been. Iowa, and, and, and New Jersey. It, it didn't matter. It, it, it just didn't feel like there was no crossover between the three lands outside of, oh, am I in Amazonia, Amazonia, and Amazonia? Yeah. Whatever. The town building rules was really the only crossover. Yeah, there's no moving between the, the, sure. the, the dimensions or, or anything like that. And it just felt eh, just totally eh to me. Okay, I can buy that. And and in truth, I can't say that I really feel like there's parallel universes going on here. Um, really, it's, to me, a clever mechanic and a theme to explain that mechanical rule to, that underlies town building. Oh, as far as you're saying the Amazonia, Amazonia, yeah, Amazonia. Exactly. I got gotcha. you. Okay. All right. But you're right. Thematically, it could very well have been the Americas, India, and... The Far East, as far as, you know, European colonization and the three worlds to which you send your uh, pants-bearing captains. It feels like it, like, oh, we have this thing to where you have to be on these three places, so we're going to call it that. that it, yeah. it felt yeah. totally just unrelated to what the theme was supposed to be. Yeah. Um, just to kind of play off of that a little bit, I'll go back to my, my original, when we decided we were going to play this game, I knew little to nothing about it. So I went to go read the back of the box. <laughs> um, read the back. Read the back. This sounds pretty interesting. I have I, no idea what it's about <laughs> or what it what the game is, though. Right? right. I still feel I haven't played that game yet. Um, the game that I read the, on the back of the box and the game we played don't quite feel like the same game. Hmm. Um, it's. I was. I was hoping yes for a little bit more of the the quantum ness of it. Just um, maybe. Uh, one, one less game state 
maybe take one of those out and maybe put another one in that, that maybe lets you do more stuff. Coalesces yeah. the theme a little bit better and, and brings it to life because I felt completely let down by it. It, it, it The first quantum, all right, well, I'm, I'm still waiting for it, I feel like. <laughs> well, that's quantum for you. Maybe it exists in another dimension. Well played, sir. Well played. Is there emergent gameplay in this? So, to my way of thinking and my definition of emergent, no. Uh, I don't think so. I think that in the game, you go from many possible states because of the various types of um, unknown unknown game states going in to it coalesces to whatever the conclusion is for that particular game. Oh, it was a lush economy. Oh, it was an austere economy. Oh, it was somewhere in the middle. Um, I don't think that it's emergent gameplay, and it's funny you ask that because just earlier we were talking about the sandbox video games uh, where, you know, gosh, almost anything can happen if it's in the programming. Those, to me, have the potential for emergent gameplay. Story games have the potential for emergent gameplay. I don't see that here. Yeah, this is a game with a big straight arrow on it. The arrow goes in different directions, but everybody's following it. <laughs> um, so if there's a lush economy, there's a lush economy. For everybody. everybody. For everybody. Yeah. Yeah, so um, there's not really a whole bunch of different paths to take except for some of the end game scoring. You can kind of take a different path there. But as far as the board state is concerned, as soon as it gets revealed and everybody can see it, then you have a pretty good idea of where the game's going to go. Kind of felt like in later eras, you you don't have a whole lot of strategic decisions because uh, the fourth, buddy, uh, fourth guy that was playing the game with us, Dan... There were times late in the game, and I, this was the case for me in the very last round of the most recent game. In round five, in, which is the penultimate round for him, he placed one one oh, settler. Yeah. And for me, I placed two uh, in the last round. And I was like, I don't really have a whole lot to do here. Yeah. Just, yeah. You've already I, done everything you need to do. Yeah, so I don't really have any decisions to make. Uh, wait, I have money. Okay, I'll hold on to it. So I can buy some benefits. Yeah. And then even then, in the last round, a lot of those benefits, they're, they're non-decisions. It's just a matter of, where do I score the most points? Oh, I'll put this here. That's not a decision. That's just... That's... Automatic. Yeah. So that definitely felt like a letdown. Did you guys have the same? I... You know, it's funny that you mentioned the third game because I think that our play had evolved by then. By the third game, y'all were uh, y'all were leaving captains behind deliberately to defend a mine or to defend the crux of your supply chain. And so I think that our ability to interfere with each other was lessened in that last game just because people were smarter and playing smarter and playing defense. Whereas in our first two games, that wasn't happening. We were always pulling the captains back, assuming they weren't you know, hip deep in an ancient civilization. Yeah, there's a lot of that going on. We, we actually did get some of that in the um, the third game we played. I have to be honest, in, in the first and second game we played, I was still trying to grasp how to get the points out of it and how to, how to best manage that. Um, so I really didn't get a whole lot into that until the last game. But yeah, I, I felt like maybe one piece too many and then another piece missing. I don't know exactly hmm. what that is. But uh, as far as the game states, there might be one piece too many, and I think there's there's one piece missing. Well, there's not a ton of interaction. Mm-hmm. I mean, th- sure, we can go and and you know uh, battle or 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 have combat or whatever, which that is all of. Oh, the, you don't have a captain there. I'll bring my ship with my captain. Oh no, and, you don't. There's no state of war marker out. Oh, okay, I can't do that. <laughs> Never mind. But if there were. Then it's one for one, kind of like a old school Civ or Advanced yeah. Civ or whatever. I lose one, you lose one, and, and keep going. And that's another question on the rules. Can keep you, going? Do you keep going or can you stop at any time? Don't know. So we just said you could stop at any time. There's just... there. The interaction was just... Oh, hey. Oh, you're going first. Oh, you get to move to that area first. Okay, you're going to do that. All right, then I'll adjust to that. Yeah. Or I'll take your workers off or your settlers. Sorry. Take your settlers off. Okay, cool. There's that. Oh, no, I don't. uh, You broke my supply train. Uh, Okay, I don't get as much income. I just it felt lacking to me. Another thing I wanted to bring up with you guys as well, I wanted to get your opinions on, are the um, the, the beginning powers that you get as each mm. as each of the players. Do you feel like those really brought a whole lot to the game? I, 
I felt like they were a little bit lacking. I, I, I felt like, yes, they made the factions at the very beginning feel a little asymmetric. But honestly, after that first little bit, whatever. So what they are is Spain always goes first. And it is an advantage to go first. So it makes sense that there's no other benefit. Portugal could look at three of the lands uh, ahead of time before the game starts. Cool. Then England starts with uh, four ship or level four. There are three ships at level four. They could carry th- four crew instead of three. That was that was not a huge advantage, uh, especially early on, because you don't have a lot of money. And by that point, other civilizations could have caught up. So that didn't feel like much of an advantage to me. And the fourth one was the Spain, who could France. go. I'm France. sorry, France. That could go and attack in one area where there wasn't a state of war marker. Minimal impact on all of those, I felt like, to where, eh, whatever. I think that you're right that those uh, powers affect the early game. You know, those were crucial in the first and second era. Portugal knowing where to go. Spain getting to go first. England flooding the map with little red little red settlers. If you have the money if to you do can. it. And I did because I was always goosing the ships to the gulls. But I think you're right that after maybe era three out of six, that, you know, all the powers were effectively the same by that point. And I feel like there should be a little bit more something to them um, than that maybe to maybe differentiate them just a little bit more um, than just those abilities at the beginning of the game. Yeah, I think by the end of the game, you know, in this quantum world of parallel universes, by the end, we're all just wearing different colored hats. So I got a couple other things here. Those fiddly rules or the overly complex rules as far as the gotcha stuff that you were talking about yeah. earlier, Ash, that you like. You like the, the town building and well, city building rules. Okay. I like the town building rule, rules. I don't like the gotcha stuff of, I want to declare war here. Ah, there's no state of war marker. I want to build a town here. Ah, there's no build marker. And that's partly because of the graphic design, because it's yeah. harder to see those tokens physically on. On the board, so I, I was going to disagree with you as far because you're like, oh, I like, but no, it's those gotcha things that really. Yeah. And the only reason we're calling them gotcha is you forget about them because they're hard to see. At least they were for us, right? They're hard to see. They're hard to keep track of. Like Matt said, you know, these dozen different uh, conditional status effects on the game. It's hard to keep track of, and the graphic design isn't helping. It's not helping as much as it should. Exactly. And ultimately what that led to for me is it didn't feel fluid. The gameplay felt stilted. It was just like, oh, I'm going to, ah, I can't. Okay, hold on. And it just uh, stops and starts, stops and starts, stops it, and starts. It felt like for me, it reminded me of when I learned to drive a stick shift car. Oh, nope. Start again. Oh, wait. Oh, exactly. now you're going. Now you're rolling. This game has a bad stutter problem. Yeah. Right. So ultimately, that 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 yeah, the the, the lack of fluidity uh, was the biggest problem I had with this. I would say beyond the graphics, kind of being that encumbrance, like I was talking about before, where you're dragging it along to have the game tell you what you need it to. You know, between the uh, physical similarity of the captains versus the settlers. Um, you know, the rules, uh, diction of settlers versus settlements, uh, exactly what markers are out and are affecting the game. Um, to me, the overall flow of the game, you know, there's there's kind of three acts to the game. In the beginning, there's not a lot of money. You're trying to do many things with no resources. By the middle, you have more and you're trying to do lots of things with more resources. And then, like you said, by the end, it almost fell a little flat where, okay, now I'm flush with resources or none of us is flush with resources and we're all fighting for these last few points. Or fighting for turn order because it's going to be the same points there. Or fighting over tokens that nobody really cares about because those cities didn't get built. Uh, religion world isn't a big deal. Um, or because, you know, there's not good places to place a cathedral where you know, I'm only getting, you know, I'm giving my opponent as many points as I'm getting out. Or of maybe I get a plus one, plus two, which, you know, in a 40 point game. Eh. And so for me, I would want the, you know, the, the kind of fl- 
when you said flow, I thought of the arc of the game. I would want the arc of the game to have a little more punch at the end, I think. Yeah, I think that's one of the pieces I think is missing is is maybe another way to score points um, at the end of the game for a, a different, uh, some, some sort of different criteria. Just to tie it all together? Yes. Now, that said, the way that the final points are scored, to me, is one of the mm, interesting, odd, uh, fiddly isn't the right word, but kind of uh, quirky parts of the game. You know, the way that cities come out, the way that you score points for the science world, for art world, was interesting. And I didn't do any statistical analysis on the points uh, for our end games, but... I couldn't tell how much it even really mattered in the grand scheme of things unless somebody went full tilt towards a good point scoring uh, world marker, the military for Matt in that second game, um, or excuse me, for Edward in that second game, um, or science for Matt in that very first game. You know, it didn't really seem to to bend the points one way or the other that far. Yeah, you either go all in or, or not at all on those. Um, it seems like you're either uh, trying to get those or you just don't bother with them at all and just keep putting your cities and towns out. Um, that seems to be where a lot of the points come from. So to wrap it up, quirky. That's the word that always comes to mind whenever I think of Ragnar Brothers. But there becomes a point in time where quirky no longer beco- is endearing and it becomes an encumbrance. And I feel like that's kind of what happened here. I understand what they were going for, but I just ultimately it felt they couldn't get out of their own way in the graphic design, the artwork, and the encumbrance of the rules getting out of the way of what could have been a pretty interesting theme and a fairly interesting mechanical game. Ultimately, It's more encumbrance than it was quirky for me, and that's a shame. In a game with multiple universes and all this stuff going on, I would expect a a little bit more from it. Um, I want to be exploring um, some vastly different worlds rather than very similar worlds with maybe slightly different landscapes. Though I will give them props for the ice desert, (laughs) a place where you can both freeze to death and die of thirst. Um, that, that is, that is unique. I don't know if they meant it that way, but they, there are blue cactuses. Um, so, um, we, we've had, we've had many, many adventures in this world over the past couple of weeks. And, um, while they have been very, very interesting to play with these guys, just ultimately the game falls flat for me and just, there's just not enough, um, meat on the bones, really enough interaction for me. I want a little bit more of a um, a, a good flow, a good uh, building. Um, some emergent gameplay would be would be wonderful. Um, it just felt very kind of kind of linear and not a lot there for me. Colonization, to be a governor of the new world or three. I should love this game. This game is set is lined up just for me. The Again, the kaleidoscoping game state where from turn to turn you begin to crystallize and see how the world will end. Uh, I love, and I love the mechanics underlying you have to do this and you have to do this before you can build that town and advance the development of your new worlds. But you're also having to drag along behind you these rules the game that won't tell you what you need to know to be able to do the thing and find the fun in the new world. Um, I want it to be there. I found it a couple of times and then, whoops, I lost it. So as far as a rating, fellas, everybody who listens knows we rate on a one to six scale. You're, you're our guest, please, <laughs> by all means. I'm going to go with a three on this one. Um, three seems to be about where it needs to be. Um, it's just... Not one of the best games I've played in the past uh, couple of months. Um, we've played some really good games, um, and this one just it doesn't shine for me like it should. It, it's, it seems a little little muddy, I guess is a good way to put it. I gave it a three as well. It's a game, like I said in my summary, it just couldn't get out of its own way a little bit, and it left me wanting, which, to me, falls in three land. Well, and it's funny that you say that. I gave it a three as well. Um, I want to like the game. There's parts that I do like, assuming that you can find them amidst the blue ice deserts. 
And fitting with the game, I think that we can all now build a town in the three world. Totally agree. So that's Nina and Pinta. All right, Amanda, you want to tell them how to get in touch with us? Our website is heavycardboard.com. Our email address is contact at heavycardboard.com. We love hearing from y'all, so please don't be shy. Our Twitter is Heavy Cardboard. Facebook is Heavy Cardboard. Our YouTube channel is Heavy Cardboard Vids. Our Instagram is Heavy Cardboard. Our Patreon is patreon.com forward slash heavy cardboard. Please take a look and give us some support. Our BGG Guild number is 2044. We also have a phone number for y'all to call and leave us voicemails if you want. The number is 720-675-8975. Call us and leave us your thoughts or questions, and hey, they might even be featured on the show unanswered. So Matt, Ash, thanks for joining me tonight on the review. Thanks for having me. Thanks for having me. Time to sail back home. Seriously, and by home, you mean about 20 steps that away. Indeed. So I'll catch you all next week back with Amanda for Great Western Trail. Until then, we're going to be doing a ton of live streams coming up this week. So hopefully you all tune in then and see you all later. Later, y'all. Bye.